My name is Madeline Rosebrook, and I'm from Eugene, Oregon. I grew up here, and I've been going to St. Alice for about a year and a half now, and I'll be entering the Sisters of Life as a postulant on September 4th. So I wanted to share a little bit about the religious order I'll be entering, because um, they're very close to my heart, and I just want to share a little bit about who they are and what their charism is, and then a little bit of their missions and apostolate in the world, kind of what that looks like, and then just a little bit of my own discernment journey. So I guess I'll start with who are the Sisters of Life, and they're a contemplative, active uh, community of women's religious in the greater New York area, but they also have convents in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, uh, Colorado, uh, Toronto, Canada, and they also are opening one in Phoenix, Arizona uh, this summer. So I just want to clarify because there's a lot of questions I get. Um, contemplative active does not mean cloister. So contemplative active means that they have a contemplative prayer life. They pray for about four and a half hours a day, but that flows into their works of charity there in the world. So they do serve in the world, uh, not in a cloistery sense. And then another thing I get a lot is the difference between nuns and religious sisters. So nuns are cloistered. They live in a convent or a monastery, um, but contemplative active would be religious sisters, uh, which is what I'll be living uh, with the Sisters of Life. That's who they are. And uh, they profess the, the three traditional vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but they also profess a fourth vow um, to protect and enhance the sacredness of human life. And that fits into their care so much I'll get into in a little bit. I just wanted to share a couple of quotes from the website on just a good explanation of who they are and kind of a little bit about them. So I'm just going to read those, if that's okay. As spiritual mothers living in the heart of the church, we experience the threats to human dignity and life all the more deeply. We pray, we fast, we serve. Why? Because we want to uphold the dignity and worth of each human person created from and for God's great love. And the other quote I really love is, the sisters of life are women who are in love with love, love incarnate, crucified, and risen, and they're captivated by the truth of the beauty of every human person created in God's image and likeness. And that's just a good foundation of who the Sisters of Life are. Uh, their apostolate and missions is what they do in the world. That's their acts of charity and service that flow from their prayer life. Mainly what they do is they serve women who are vulnerable to abortion and in several different aspects. So they have a pregnancy resource center. They have a few, one in New York, one in Philadelphia, and one in Toronto, Canada. And that helps women with a lot of different things, with material support, financial support. Um, they throw baby showers for women. They provide a listening ear. Um, they support women at doctor's offices. A lot of women need someone to go with them to the doctor or to the delivery room. They don't have anyone to be there for them. They also uh, have a huge network of people who work with them who provide everything from legal support to jobs uh, for women who need it. And when I visited this convent in March, I just felt like I was on a spiritual battlefield. The presence of good and evil in the combat was so real there. Um, there were sisters everywhere with headsets on talking to women all over the world who desperately needed help. And uh, they were visiting with women in person. They have mountains of baby clothes. It's like chaos, but in the best sort of way. Um, and they help women see that pregnancy is a gift, not a disease. And they help them achieve their dreams and support their baby at the same time. So a question that they always ask a woman who comes in is, if everything was different and you had all the material and family support in the world, would you want to keep your baby? And the answer is always yes. So what the Sisters of Life do is give the woman support that she needs so that she can do that. 
They also have a special convent located in the heart of the city in New York called Sacred Heart Convent. And in that convent, they actually invite women to live with them. So they usually have four or five mothers at a time living with them. And they move in anywhere in usually the first or second trimester of their pregnancy. And then they stay until about um, just under a year when the, the baby's just under a year old because the convent hasn't been baby proof. So they will have them for almost a full year and just offer them special support, um, especially for women who don't have a place to live or a family to take care of them. And they also host retreats of all kinds at their retreat house. They have an evangelization mission. So they speak all over the country. They do parish visits, uh, speaking on the cares of the life. They have a YouTube page where they do different videos. They have written publications. And um, they, they do outreach to college students in Colorado. And then they also have a hope and healing after abortion convent where they work with women and offer counseling and healing retreats for women who have already experienced the pain of abortion. And then they also run the Respect for Life office in the Diocese of New York. So they're very busy. Um, so that's the kind of an overview of all the different missions that they have. Um, they're all located in the New York area. And then the convents um, in the other surrounding areas in the United States are specialized missions from that. And the convent in Canada is all of that in one, or Canada. So now I just want to talk a little bit about their charism, because that's the heart of the order. And I just want to give a definition of a charism from the Catechism of the Church uh, real quick. So this is just a definition of a charism. It's whether extraordinary or simple and humble, charisms are graces of the Holy Spirit which directly or indirectly benefit the Church, ordered as they are to her building up to the good of men and to the needs of the world. So for example, the Dominican um, order, their charism is preaching. And for the Sisters of Life, their charism is life. So it encapsulates who they are, not just what they do. And everything in the order is directed towards the sacredness of human life. So their founder, John Cardinal O'Connor, when he first founded the order in the 90s, he had a lot of questions on what will the sisters do? What will they do in the world? What will it look like? And for him, it was never about what they would do. It was about who they would be. And his answer was, they will be mothers. So here is the amazing quote from him on the car um, from the Cardinal on what the charism of life is. And it is, this is the charism of the Sisters of Life, to mother the mothers of the unborn, to mother the unborn, to mother all those who are frail, all those who are vulnerable, all those who are ill, all those who are in danger of being put to death, all those whose lives the world considers useless. Our Lord says to each Sister of Life, woman, behold your son, behold your daughter. And that's just like a very brief explanation of the charism. You could probably delve into it for the rest of your life through so many different aspects. Um, that's just a little idea of what it is. And uh, now I just want to share a little bit of my own discernment journey and kind of what drew me into the Sisters of Life. So I first felt a nudge in my heart towards religious life back in high school. But I didn't know that it was something that women still did, especially women my age. So I just want to share a little bit about what discernment looks like. Um, so I was in high school, like I said, when I first felt a little call to become a religious sister, but I had no context for it. So I kind of just set it aside and moved on and went to college. And I was in college when I went to the Focus Seat Conference in 2019 in Indianapolis. And that was really my first experience of what it looks like to be Catholic as a young adult. I was surrounded by about 20,000 uh, college students who were on fire for their faith, which is something I had never experienced before. And not only that, there was hundreds of men and women religious that were present at the conference as well. And I had
had never, I had never seen religious sisters, and I had never seen young religious sisters, but they were everywhere. And for the first time in my life, I, I thought, oh, this is something I can see myself doing because people like me are doing this everywhere, just not in the state of Oregon that I was aware of at that time. So that was a huge moment for me, and I started to become open that that might be a possibility for me, and I would have to be happy being a religious sister. So I left that conference open um, to discerning religious life, because I realized that in other parts of the country, there's really active young religious quarters that I didn't know about. And that was also when I saw the Sisters of Life for the first time, and they were so vibrant and so alive and so joyful. I was in a church nearby the conference center on the last day, just looking at a uh, nativity scene, because it was Christmas time, and they all came in at once. There was like 12 of them, and something about them stood out to me. So when I went to discern religious life, years later, they were the first quarter I looked at, and the only one I really discerned with because everything about them just stood out to me as everything I wanted to be. So um, I reached out to the order and started to speak with a vocations director a year ago. And that was really helpful because it, she was able to uh, put religious life in context and day-to-day -day life and help me sort through my own thoughts and what was going on in my own head. And she also invited me to come visit, I uh, come and see retreat, which was hugely helpful for me because I had never visited a convent. I had never seen what it looked like to be a religious sister, um, but I've seen the holy marriages. I'm surrounded by good people who are married. So I'd seen that vocation and had that context. So then to go visit and see a different type of vocation in person was very, very helpful to my discernment process. Um, when I walked in the door, I knew I was home. I just felt at home and at peace immediately. I never felt so myself as when I was there visiting them. Uh, I've been there three times this past year, just in the discernment process at different retreats. And that was very helpful for me. Um, so I guess just to, um, share a little bit about what I'll be doing this year. So on September 4th, I'll be entering the Sisters of Life as a postulant. And that's the very first um, stage in entering a religious community. So postulant just comes from the Latin word to ask a question. And you're just asking the question, is this my vocation, more seriously. And uh, I'll continue to serve with the order while I'm there and learn what the externals of religious life are and learn how to live in the community and kind of learn the way of religious life. And that'll be 10 months long. So I'll enter in September and it'll be through July. Um, and uh, just continue to discern whether this is what God is calling me to do. So I would love it if um, you guys would keep me in your prayers as I take this next step in discerning. When you discern, they take you on an eight-day extended stay. Okay. So pretty much you just live the life for eight days. Wow. And see if it's really for you and if it's what you thought it was. And that was so helpful. I would say I did consider myself a devout Catholic growing up. Because, um, uh, let me think. I was homeschooled and I had a really great Catholic education. So I was always learning about the faith from the age of kindergarten. So I always knew what was going on at church and it always came very naturally to me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really start like making it my own and practicing my faith for myself until college actually, until freshman year of college. I started with the Newman Center as a freshman in college, so that was very helpful. Um, I started praying every day. It was not super consistent, but more than I ever had before, and that was also very helpful. It was also helpful because 
I wasn't responsible for getting myself to church because my schedule was off for my parents even though I still lived at home. And just having the responsibility and like realizing like I'm supposed to go to church every Sunday, but I want to. And that's my responsibility, not my parents anymore, was very helpful for me too. The other thing that was a huge for me was my sophomore year of college was um, like summer going into sophomore year of college, I believe, was the year that all of the scandals came out in the church um, that I remember clearly. And that really just made me sit back because I was at Protestant College and they were talking about it um, and just think like, is this really where I want to be? Because all this is going on. And for me, there was like no question that I would stay. And it just kind of reminded me of John 6 where the disciples were like, this is really hard, you know, a lot of people are leaving. And then Jesus asked them if they were going to leave too. And they're like, no, where would we go? And that was kind of my thought process. I just remember just thinking one day, I have nowhere else to go. And I don't want to go anywhere else. So it's hard. But that was like my real conscious decision that I'm here and I'll always be here. I love St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. She's amazing. Well, what, what about her? She was very young when she entered. She's about my age. Um, and she has such great writing. And it's so honest just about her struggles and about experiencing suffering and pain and happiness and joy and her relationship with her family um, during the discernment process and when she entered. That's what I've been reading a lot of this year. And She's very similar to me in some ways. In some ways, she's different. Her family was not supportive, mine is. But yeah, she's a great um, writer. I just love her relationship with Jesus. Uh, it's hard to, to like it's hard to describe or to pinpoint what that would be. I, it definitely takes a couple days to sell in because it's just so different. Um, you don't have a cell phone, you don't really have access to the internet. So you have a lot more space to be yourself, that's one thing. But it, because you're so busy in the world, at least this has been my experience visiting the past couple of times, is it takes me a couple of days to like settle in because it's uncomfortable to let all that go because it's distracting. So it distracts you from yourself. Um, but once I got into the rhythm of life there, I just felt so free to be myself and to not have to worry about what people were thinking about me or what people were saying. I didn't have um, like distractions with phone or internet or anything like that every few minutes. Um, everyone there doesn't have that either. So everyone is a lot more free to be themselves. And to be in a positive environment like that just encourages and builds upon it. Um, you have a lot of time in silence, so you can really hear yourself think, which is hard, but it also like makes you more in tune with your emotions and like, why am I feeling this way? Or why do I love this so much? Like, why does this bother me? Um, which was very helpful in discerning. Um, but yeah, I just felt like, like there's a lot of extroverts in the order and a lot of introverts, so it's pretty well mixed. And just because it is a different way of life doesn't mean you have to have one personality or another. But for me as an introvert, I just had a lot more space. So I could talk to people and hang out when I wanted, but I also didn't have to. And just, there's like, I'm just like thinking of this all. Um, but I guess one of the other really helpful things is there's no pressure to be a certain way because if you fully yourself, that's like what they want, um, and ultimately what God wants. So there's no like, I guess the world puts a lot of pressure on you to be a certain way, and that's not present at all there. Like they want you to be your holiest self, but not like in a set way, just like how that is for you. And that's hard to describe. <laughs> no, that was great. My immediate family is very supportive of it, and they're very excited about it. But it is definitely a hard thing to change. And like for myself, it's very hard 
to change. I don't like change. So even though like I feel so much peace and joy about entering, it's still going to be a huge change. So that's definitely hard. And I can tell that that's hard for my immediate family as well. And for my extended family, it's a little bit more difficult to say just the way it plays out. But I would say like, my dad's family is super Catholic and they're so excited about it. They just have a lot of misconceptions um, on religious life, which is fine because I do too. So it's been a real like educational process for all of us, myself included, on what it means to enter religious life. So it's really cool to see how it's growing the faith of my entire family. Um, so that's been a really cool experience, but it's definitely hard to experience change and see it happen. Um, my mom's side of the family, they're not Catholic, so that's been a really hard. It's definitely not easy at all. Um, so they, it's just, it seems like a waste to a lot of people to throw away the career and having a family um, to do something so countercultural. I would say don't be afraid to explore the vocation because it's a healthy thing to discern religious life whether or not you get married because even if it's not your vocation to have an understanding of it and like a um, empathy for priests and religious sisters is super helpful for a healthy community so don't be afraid to ask the question and to um, explore it and call a vocations director or look up resources online or ask your parish priest because um, it never hurts to look into it and you never know until you try. Um, it, but it does take a lot of courage to take that first step and to actually look into it because you don't know what the answer will be. Um, but the freedom of looking into it and knowing this is what I'm called to do, or this is not for me, is so worth it. Because God would never ask you to do something um, that makes you miserable. He wants you to be full of life and joyful. So you can never go wrong asking the question and looking into it.